The most interesting solo runs are the ones with unique aspects. Things like Shedinja and its 1 HP and Wonder Guard, or maybe bringing Shadow Lugia to life in Generation 1, they were a breath of fresh air. But as far as the results go, these two could not be on more opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think today's video is going to be somewhere between that. Today, we're going to be taking a look at how Reggie Alecki would do in a Generation 1 solo challenge. And if you're new here, I do several runs, I optimize the playthroughs, we see how fast we can make the runs, and then I rank them against other Pokemon. And if you're wondering how did I do this, the long and short of it is I made it. The GitHub disassemblies are down below and I do offer patch files to any members and Patreons, but enough of that. If you need any more information about anything, maybe you want to know about ROM creation, rules, or just anything else, check out that description. But grab yourself a Sodi Pop and I'm just, I'm ready to get to it. So what makes Reggie Alecki unique? It's this ridiculous 200 base speed. Since crit rates go off your base speed in Generation 1, this means that this Pokemon has a nasty 39% crit rate, and that's on every single move. And I've been wanting to kind of see it in action for a while. Now the rest of the stats, they're, they're all right. Nothing to really write home about, but everything is pretty solid outside of that honestly pretty bad 50 base defense. And today's move pool is really simple. It's based off of the Generation 8 set. It's pretty much all electric or normal outside of Ancient Power. And for the TMs, Thunderbolt and Body Slam are pretty much the only noteworthy things to even mention. And we'll go over like the new moves, Reggie Alecki's signature moves and stuff like that a little bit later in the video. This Pokemon, it's structured much like other electric runs we've seen in the past. And I would compare this one directly to Zapdos. It's a pretty great Pokemon that specifically doesn't want to see Rock and ground types early and unfortunately for us we are on a head-on collision course to Brock. So let's get started we can kind of go over how I solved the problem. First and foremost let me stress that I tried this at all possible levels and there's just there's no way to get to Brock immediately and that means that extra training is going to be mandatory. But let me touch on something that I never really talk about and it's the optional rival fight that's to the left of Viridian Route 22. At first glance you might think hey I'm fighting everything anyway it's just another trainer and I should just fight it because I need levels. And let me let it down for you because this one is very inefficient. It's why I never do it in any video. Even if you go to it, you one shot both Pokemon, which even this run that has super effective damage can't guarantee one shots. It's only worth 217 experience. Now take into account that it's a little bit out of the way. You have to walk over there, then you have to backtrack after that, and there's a chance to get wild encounters to waste even more time. And just to pile on that even further, consider that you can just get sand attacked and waste a lot of time here. It's just rarely ever worth it if your goal is to be as efficient or just to play the games in an optimized way in general. I am gonna be taking on all three of the bug catchers in Viridian Forest, and let me just say, I've never had a run where I got poisoned as much as I do in this one. Every practice run, doesn't matter. I'm using the first antidote here. It felt like I could restart, it would happen again, and just down the line, I was getting poisoned so much. But don't get me heated, don't get me started on that. We do take out the bug catchers. There's not really much to say because it's just a bunch of Weedles and Kakunas and Caterpies. But now it's actually gonna be time for some Mott Years Blackout Grinding. And I know what you're thinking, a cross-gen run that needs to do light years grinding like a lowly plebeian, it doesn't seem like it would be that good. And I would tell you to reserve judgment until you see how the everything shakes out in the run, but to keep this as brief as possible, if you're new, trainer Pokemon get 50% extra experience. So you take out this little sausage here named Diglett, you get your 190 experience, you let the Sancho take you out after that, and then you rinse and you repeat until you're where you want to be at. Today I need to do this only like a handful of times, so it doesn't really take that long and Reggie Alecki is pretty good at this type of grinding. Rapid spin is sufficient enough and you can just stall the Diglett to take damage by using one of your electric moves into the ground topping and it just makes it go by a little faster. I'll also quickly talk about some of the new moves real quick. Rapid spin got a buff in later generations. Outside of removing things like leech seed, rap, and things of that nature, it did get a bump to 50 base power and it also now raises your speed by one stage which Fortress would have loved that if we had that in our Gen 2 run we did a little bit ago. We also got Electro Web. It's the first of Reggie Alecki's two signature moves. In this context, it's pretty much only a 55 base damage, 95% accurate electric moves. In modern games, it does lower the opponent's speed by one stage, but that part of the move is just really irrelevant with 200 base speed. I didn't even bother to code that part in. And the last thing I'll say here is that my nickname, we'll talk about it for a second. It stands for Biblically Accurate Light Bulb. And I guess if you don't know what the phrase Biblically Accurate Angel means, then the name sort of falls short. But it's also also a little bit of a double entendre because its acronym sounds like bulb. I don't know. Let's just, does that make any sense? Let's move on. Overall, we're grinding here in 
Naruto, we're pretty deep into level 11, and when you go back in and actually finish the fight, you will get to level 12, and this was huge for making the run not be completely awful. I showed the Gen 8 learn set from the start, and on my overlay, I forgot to put ancient power on it, but you do get that at level 12. Now, generally, for doing fights like this, you want to hit damage rounding thresholds, you want to be something like level 10, maybe level 13, but today, we'll be taking on Brock at level 12. We got ancient power in hand, and let's just see how it goes. This one is straightforward. Ancient Power has a 10% chance for the Omni Boost, and that's gonna raise all of our stats by one stage. And for this run, we're gonna be, we're gonna cast out that reel, we're gonna be fishing for it. We have five uses, and to be completely transparent, I did restart this run a couple of times to get this result. Even though all of your moves are resisted, the crits can kinda cancel out some of the pain here, but to give this Pokemon its best shot, I cut out an entire level getting up to 13 because boosting is love and boosting is life. You can see that I actually get it here, but the problem is actually our 50 base defense. It really hurts. We take a lot of damage. I get through, but we're boosted, so we can talk about Onyx. And to no one's surprise, I outspeed. And this one is just, it's a real simple matter of just using rapid spin, hoping that it doesn't use tackle too much. You pay attention to when it uses bide so that you can use electric moves to not take unnecessary damage. And I'm not gonna pretend like it's a great fight, but even though Reggie Alecki is just barely limping away from this fight with only seven HP, it has finished a nightmare battle and we can start to plan for the future. So let's address the elephant in the room. A great run like Shadow Lugia that we just saw in the last cross gen run, it would finish Brock around seven minutes. And here we are sitting at 20 minutes and 29 seconds. This means that right from the jump, we are in a 13 minute hole very early. And with how good and competitive these cross gen runs are, we're just gonna have to root for the underdog today if you want Reggie Alecki to make something of himself. From here on out, I'm gonna try my best to trim all the fat off of this Reggie Alecki steak. And we're gonna try to give it its best run possible. So that means it's gonna be the bare minimum track all the way to Cerulean. And we can just pick back up there and we're actually gonna take on Misty immediately. I don't know why I said actually, because we are electric type. We have some solid moves. We got great speed. That means that it's the clear choice just to catch up on levels due to the slow leveling group. And this one, it's not great. It's not really that fast. It's gonna take us into another kind of problem I should start touching on now. I have six total turns in this battle. I start out with a miss. Remember, Electro Web only has 95% accuracy. And then I hit four straight times with no crit. So no crit, four straight hits. And I do get a crit at the very end when it doesn't matter, but that's sort of the nature of this Pokemon. But we do get the second badge. That's really the important thing now. So let me elaborate on not critting four times in a row. And I do have to say that it's a more common occurrence than you would think. 40% crit on paper it looks really good and it would be it would be great if it was kind of like a supplementary or like a complementary aspect of this pokemon but the reality is that if this pokemon had let's say 50 base speed its base stat total would be poor its move pool would be limited and the slow leveling group would just amplify those problems the problems overall i had after doing three runs with this pokemon is that it actually needs crits to get through battles fast and the need for those crits only increase the deeper you go into the game and having a 61% chance to not crit just means that more often than not you're going to be just doing less than impressive damage you're just kind of slow now the run isn't bad I don't want to come off as negative but I often think of these runs as like many reviews of each Pokemon in the context of a solo challenge so for me it's important to kind of document my thoughts on the matter but let's go to the next battle Pidgeotto is first, we have the top advantage, and we actually, we get the crit here to eliminate any possibility of a sand attack, and you already know what that's gonna mean for this battle. I can rapid spin the Abra, and remember that rapid spin does raise our speed one stage, and we'll return to that soon, but the rest of the Pokemon can't withstand the electric damage, and Reggie Alecki gets through this one pretty easy as you would expect. Now we get to Nugget Bridge. We got that coming up and you already, you're, you know the drill guys. You wanna make this part quick, single highs, cluster, whatever words I usually say. But I would like to skip ahead a little bit and pick up with the Elixir Hiker here because this is the second run in with the rock and ground types. Now you could fight the single Onyx Hiker, but I chose this one because of rapid spin. Now the cool thing about using the program to read the RAM of the game is that we can see the badge boost glitch kicking in in real time and we can get like tangible evidence of how they work. 
hurt. Now you're gonna see me get two speed boosts and it's gonna give me two bumps overall in my attack on the Machop. And that's just gonna make the Geodude a little bit quicker overall. Now the alternative was just to kind of bang my head against the Onyx, but Rapid Spin, it did have a little use that maybe you wouldn't expect at first glance in this run. And it's not the last time we'll talk about it. Now let's go down to the SSN and just like any crews, we're obviously gonna be busting into people's rooms and stealing their stuff. In this case, Body Slam needs no introduction, but it is the best answer for our rock and ground top lows. And it's gonna continue to be the answer until the end of the game. So it's very important for this run. What's not important are the next two fights and we'll start with the third rival fight. The important thing here is to hammer home how fickle it is to have your identity tied to just having high crit chance. I'm gonna throw out five total moves in this fight. None of them are gonna crit, one of them misses. And this fight still, it's not slow, but still pretty quick. There's nothing to really complain about, but it's just another example of 39% crit just not really meaning that much. Now, speaking of not meaning that much, Surge is here, and there's there's no doubt to how this fight's gonna go, and ultimately, for this run, Surge is just a vending machine to give me Thunderbolt a little bit earlier, but here I crit on three of four moves, and while you might think, hey, that's great, your luck's turning around, my perspective is that it's frustrating to get a ton of crits when they, they just don't mean anything. But in other battles where you really need the crit, you're kind of just sitting there struggling. But I digress, we won't get into that just now. Let's fast forward to Rock Tunnel, and we need to talk about the Boomer Hacker today because the theme continues where we don't really have any real answers to rock and ground tops. But once again, we're talking about rapid spin, brother. Whereas earlier we were using it for like a minor attack boost from the badge boost glitch, now we have Surge's badge and the defense boost is gonna come in clutch. Now I don't really care about the damage here so much as getting the six boost to up our defense and tank some damage. And this one's not clean. I do lose a good bit of health, but I'm able to get through this one and it's because of those defense boosts and it's a pretty good sign when you're not strong against the boomer hacker and you can just make it through it on the first try. So now we're picking back up in Celadon and I am gonna be taking on the hideout first. Now sure, there's there's another rock and ground type battle in here, but I don't wanna take on Erica yet. There's sleep potential and I think that would be a bigger time loss. So I'm gonna hold off for now. We're gonna get to that next damage rounding threshold at 30. Overall this fight, it's not the fastest in the world. We've said that a lot. I do make a minor mistake. I go for rapid spin to set up some badge boost, but I don't see that I'm gonna level up right after this. So I kind of waste some time. And I guess ultimately what this battle comes down to is the fact that Kangaskhan's weakness is that it has awful special, but this one is really close because I, I don't get the one shot on the Kangaskhan. We get extremely low, but a win is a win. I'll take it. Now I'm gonna head towards Erica, but first I'm gonna get fly so I can save a little bit of time. We can just fly to Pokemon Tower right after it. Now, originally I looked at the footage, I reviewed everything, and I thought I was wasting time here because I should be just going ahead and shopping today. The reasoning is that I'm not picking up high money items. I'm not gonna be buying vitamins at all. So just get it out of the way, save a little time. And that's really sound logic. It makes a lot of sense. In fact, I did another run after this where I corrected a few mistakes I made in this run, but it turned out just to be slower. So we're sticking with this one. It's really funny sometimes to me that sometimes you can do three runs, but sometimes you just really nail a run on your second attempt. And it always feels kind of weird that the third run is just kind of like inferior, but it is what it is. As for Erica, we get the best case scenario here with an early poison. This means that sleep is no longer on the table, it can't waste our time, and it makes things just a little faster. Razor Leaf could be an issue, but you can actually tank a couple of them if you need to. And I do try to get a little cutesy here with a couple of rapid spins on the Tangela to put Vile Plume into a better range. I'm not sure if that was actually needed or faster at all, but that's really the only analysis for the rest of the fight. After's when I'm actually gonna do the shop buy, we just talked about it. And then I talked about in the Lugia video that vitamins just aren't worth as much as you would think. But how it relates to this video specifically is that I'm simply trying to cut out as much as I can to kind of salvage that slow Brock split. But I will be picking up a Poke Doll for Mimic and we'll actually talk about that later. When it comes to Pokemon Tower, it's, it's skippable. All you need to know is this little clip here where a neutral Thunderbolt is enough to one shot the Gastly's. And with that information, it should let you know that everything else is gonna be trivial as well. And we're just moving at a real fast pace here. There is some cleanup to do in the Safari Zone outside of the HMs and picking up the full restore. Um, once again, I'm skipping all vitamins and there's really nothing else to talk about. Now let's get to some of that juicy stuff. And it's my decision to go to Fuchsia first and take on Koga. The reality is that Koga and Rival Number 5, both of those, they are both struggles in their own right. And you just kind of need to make a choice, but let's just take a look and see how it goes. I entered this one poison, so maybe I can avoid toxic at the end, I guess. And in hindsight, I really don't like this strategy. 
but there's not anything I can do about it now. The most optimal way through this fight, and you could probably guess through what we've talked about so far, is to crit. And I don't want anyone to think I'm being negative, but I don't see any relevant crits to the first two Pokemon here. I'm getting chipped down, but I will level up after the muck, so I pivot to another strategy. Remember Rapid Spin? Well, it's gonna run it back. It's an unsung hero of the run, and the idea here is maybe I can boost my defense, and I'll be the first to admit it's a bit of a desperate and on-the-fly strategy, but I set up to plus four, we got our defense boost boosted, but we're only at 38 HP while poisoned going into the wheezing. I don't think I would survive a self-destruct here, so it's pretty much all up to RNG, and it starts off about as bad as possible by me missing the first Thunderbolt. I take multiple instances of poison damage, I'm getting chipped down, I do hit with the second Thunderbolt, and I'm at 13 health, and this one, it's gonna be really tight. The Poke Gods toss me a bone, wheezing misses with the smog, but my follow-up Thunderbolt is not enough. At this point, I'm at 6 HP, and I need a miracle, and Koga said, I got you, bro. It uses an X attack, skips his turn, and that gives me the opening I need to end this battle. Now, I was not lying when I said some of these battles were tough, but I do, going back to what I said earlier, I think being pre-poisoned just wasn't worth the hassle, but it only cost fractional time, and we didn't actually reset, so it doesn't matter, so let's zoom up to Saffron and take a look at Sylph, and don't blink now because the rest of the game is starting to come at us real fast. I do visit the 10th floor for the rare candy, and after that we're going to hit level 36, after we take on the Arbok Grunt guarding the card key, and this is a very significant level. There's one more move we haven't talked about yet, and it's the other significant signature move of Reggie Alecki and it's called Thunder Cage. Now I used my artistic liberties to change this move to what felt more Gen 1 and more balanced, but this is a trapping move like Rap, which means that if you go first, your opponent just doesn't get to play the game in Gen 1, but trapping moves are a little bit different in later games. They have a base damage, in this case Thunder Cage has 80 base power, it's gonna hit, it's gonna do that damage, and then each subsequent turn is only gonna do 1 8th of the target's max health, and rather than not being able to move, they are still free to select moves and battle normally outside of switching out. If you were just to blindly take this move, take the damage, and just copy and paste it into Gen 1, it would be too broken, and I don't think there's any argument to be had there. 80 base power with stab, 90% accuracy, hitting 2 to 5 turns on a 200 base speed Pokemon that's just perpetually going to go first, you can, you can see the problem. My compromise here was to pretty much make it a Clamp clone. For me, Clamp is Generation 1's best trapping move. It has 35 base power, and I felt like it was kind of a good compromise to gen one this move. I did keep the accuracy and the power points the same, but I needed to talk about this move because if you think about it, it allows Reggie Alecki to utilize its speed not only for crits, but now I can use it just to basically win any battle at the cost of extra time. But we can take a look at it in action in just a second. Now I use my all my rare candies here. We have seven and it gives us a pretty big boost to be up for the challenges ahead as well as ward off uh, wild encounters down in Pokemon Mansion, but that's not important. But rival number five is swiftly approaching. So let's just see how that goes. Pidgeot is up first, and it's just a bird. No crits are needed here, just Thunderbolt it, and we can just move on with our life. Growlithe might as well be a bird because it meets the same fate. And now let's talk about something a little more interesting. In this footage, the extra levels do let me get through this fight by just going straight damage, like a crit here with Body Slam. But if I wasn't confident in the ranges, I would just go Thunder Cage. I would lock these little eggs out from playing the game until it got into a range where I could finish it off, but overall the extra levels from the candy and the fact that he has no rock or ground tops yet on his team. It just makes us a good matchup, but we'll see Thunder Cage used like this in a bit. We don't have to look at Giovanni number two because it's not a hassle. And let me focus on the fact that we get Mimic in this run. It's a very common move to see in solo challenges because it's just so good. But it's important to note that this is the first cross-gen run that I've ever really needed to use this move. It's just kind of like a testament to how limited Reggie Alecki's move pool is, if anything else. But we can just dive straight into Sabrina. You have some options here. Ultimately, the Venomoth and status conditions are pretty much the only potential slowdown and taking something like Psychic from Kadabra is the riskier play, but I decided to go for straight damage once again, and that's good enough for the first two Pokemon, and finally we get to see Thunder Cage in action a little bit. Now you guys know how rap works, and I touched on it, so let me just reiterate this and explain one more time so I don't have to keep saying it, but when you don't have good ranges, you can just trade a slightly slower battle to safely put a Pokemon into a range 
range where you can just get rid of it. I get unlucky here. We get a two hit crit that triggers a hyper potion. And you can see that it just takes a little extra time, but we are safe, we're healthy. And at the end of the day, we only need a couple of body slams on Alakazam just to seal the deal. That's gonna take us into a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And routing this way meant that I did have to remember to pick up strength. And with that candy and the two rare candies in the mansion, we do have three more left to play with for the rest of the run. Outside of that, I do take a moment to ponder on if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not. And we can just dive into Blaine now. Here you could play it safe. You could use Thunder Cage on maybe like Rapidash if you wanted to, or the Arcanine since it's the one shots they aren't as likely. In the case of Arcanine, you just can't ever one shot it, but I decided to go for more of a YOLO route here just to save some time. I go straight Thunderbolt. There's not really any analysis or in-depth strategy to speak of outside of that. Keeping that pace going directly into the final gym, we've seen the strategy before. First, you kind of just have to slowly chip your way through the Rhyhorn. It's annoying, it's slow, but you really can't do anything about it. But you can see how serious I was about this fight because I'm only half health. But the reality and the real reason for it is that I only had one potion left and I wanted to save it until the after this fight. It's a risk, but sometimes you just need to do that. The play here is to mimic dig on Doug Trio. And if this little sausage trio just digs after you mimic, there's no need to panic. You can just use dig and this will cause its dig to miss on the next turn and you can get through without worrying about taking massive super effective damage. Now at this point, dig is gonna put in some work and if you're worried about something like red version Rhydon, it just can't hurt you. And that sounds weird because it's a ground type, but the only ground move it has is Fissure. And it's just going to spam it forever. And since we outspeed, it can't hit that move. So this one's over with. After the battle, I use my final potion and I make a tiny little blunder here. So let's jump into rival number six to talk about exactly what it was. At the start, it's, it's just a bird. We know the drill by now. Thunderbolt, it's gonna go down. And the problem that I just alluded to was that I should have used an elixir for this fight because I only have three body slams left for the Rhyhorn, and that's just not gonna cut it, bud. I do think quickly on my feet, and I actually use Mimic on Tail Whip here. I use the remaining PP to lower its defense, and I have just enough PP to put the Rocky Rhino into the dirt without having to reset. Growlithe is whatever, and you know how that goes, but given the situation here and how much damage I've already taken, we get to see another instance of relying on Thunder Cage to eliminate some risk from the battle. For the execute, it's slow, it's resisted, but the worst case scenario happens, I miss, but I do only get poisoned, and that should be manageable going ahead. On Alakazam, I'm in a little bit of a catch-22 situation. It can hit me really hard, and if I don't crit, it's likely gonna knock me out, but if I play it safe with Thunder Cage, I'm gonna be taking poison damage each and every turn, and I'm already kinda low. Now, I'm gonna go with the safe play here, I'm going to use Thunder Cage, and the damage is just really adding up fast. By the time we make it through, I'm at a mere 14 health. I'm deep in the red, and I need to one-shot the Blastoise to keep the resetless run alive. I let a Thunderbolt loose, and I don't crit, but I do have enough damage to take out the Tanky Turtle. I barely survive, and we move on towards the final battles of the game. Going into the league, I wouldn't say that it's going to be easy, but there are a grand total of three more rock and ground type Pokemon to worry about. But to try to save some more time, I'm going to forego the rare candy and Victory Road. I'm going to skip all extra battles. And honestly, there's not really much more to say. Now, this is a spot that I would like to take a look at the split data, but honestly, guys, my little split script I had messed up for this run, and I don't want to manually enter all the data, so that should be back next time. But the only data that we would realistically surmise from looking at the um, split chart would be that we had a slow Brock and Regieleki is a little bit slow in certain areas. Overall, Regieleki, it's had more struggles than other cross-gen runs, but it does have some poise. It does have some moxie to be at this point with zero resets. And let's see how it finishes out the game. Lorelai's up first, and we don't have to be coy or bashful and beat around the bush with this one. 
I don't need to take Amnesia from the Slowbro. I don't have to chip down Pokemon with Thunder Cage. I can just go straight Thunderbolt and just enjoy the top advantage and just kind of ease my way through this first battle. There's not much more to say. Bruno was up next, and while the footage here is going to make this look like maybe this has potential to be a close battle, it's really not. Sure, Onyx has a ton of defense, and me not getting crits here makes this one go on for a little while, but just have a little faith in Reggie Alecki. I might be a little hurt, I might be a little bit low, but there's a clear cut strategy for Bruno battles. I'm just gonna mimic Ice Punch, and the next three Pokemon are gonna be pretty easy one shot ranges. There's not gonna be too much to worry about. And at the end of the day, I'm just kinda daring Bruno to take his shot with the Machamp after it barely survives a Thunderbolt, but he decides just to use Focus Energy, and what can you say? That's Bruno for you. Going into Agatha, I did use my final three rare candies, and this one isn't too great. High special on her Pokemon dictates that this battle, more than any other, is going to rely very heavily on Thunder Cage. We need that trapping move because something like Hypnosis into Nightshades or Dream Eaters would just be a death sentence and just eat through our HP fast. I don't really need to elaborate or kind of commentate on the play-by-play -play of this battle overall because how the first Gengar played out is kind of how the rest of it's going to shake up. Now I take some risk on the final Gengar, and I've already mentioned this a couple of times, but a battle like this where you have to use Thunder Cage, it just sort of adds a little bit of time to the run, but I will say that it makes what was a pretty tough battle relatively safe. Up next is Lance, and this is just kind of like, finally, a Reggie Alecki just working exactly how the good lord intended. If I see good numbers and it works, I love to use Mimic on Hyper Beam in this fight, and while that does open us up for some heavy Hydro Pump damage from the Water Snake, we are just kind of already set up. I don't necessarily need crits for this fight, but I do Hyper Beam crit two times in a row on the Dragonairs, there's a little tear rolling down my cheek, my little boy's growing up, and at this point, Reggie Alecki is starting to believe. Aerodactyl is weak to Thunderbolt, so it's kind of a quick in and out, and for Dragonite, I'm simply just too low to take any risk. This means that we have to draw upon our Thunder Cage Whale once more again, and we bring this dragon into the no fun zone. You don't get to play the game today, buddy. It works out pretty well, but it does get a Hyper Potion, and it makes this one take even longer, but that does get us the win, and there's just, there's only one battle left. Pidgeot is in the lead once again, and I don't need to elaborate. It's a bird. It's weak to electric. It goes down in one hit. Let's just move on. On Alakazam, I need to open myself up to some damage here so that I can mimic Psychic just so this fight doesn't take even longer than it already does. This will let us actually hit the Rhydon coming up next for neutral damage, and I'm going to call out here what I felt was another mistake at the time. Rhydon and Arcanine, they're going to go down pretty easy, so I don't really need to do a voiceover for what's happening there, but looking back, I thought that maybe mimicking wing attack or sky attack from the Pidgeot might be a better move overall, but just like shopping earlier, I did try this out in another run and it didn't pan out, but I do like the critical thinking there. Now, for Executor, you're about to see some of the absolute slowest footage of a battle ever. If I go Body Slam, it's likely just going to put me to sleep with Hypnosis, and my defense is already two stages debuffed, so that means that this would likely be a reset. Now this is the most important use of Thunder Cage in the entire run, and you can see just how little those resisted little ticks of damage do, but this is slow and steady, it's safe, it's slow, I don't love it, but it just works. Now something else I would quickly like to talk about, and I probably should have mentioned this at the very start of the video, is the choice of starters. Blastoise is weak to electric, but so is Charizard. If you picked Venusaur, there would be a Gyarados on this team, and it would be too easy, I think. Blastoise and its bulk, and specifically Executor in the champion battle, was just kind of the clear choice for the highest difficulty, and you can just see how much it stalls out the playthrough. Now, if there's any argument for the other rival teams, I would love to hear it, but I don't think there is one. But at the end of the fight is the Tanky Turtle. I get a little cocky here, and I go for Thunderbolt, but I miss the range, and I don't crit, which is very fitting for how this run has went to this point. I think I'm good, but it goes for bot, and with the two stages of lower defense, it does some nasty damage, but the important thing is that Reggie Alecki lives and I'm able to finish off the battle and ultimately the run on the next turn. 
Like I said earlier, I don't have my split data, so let's just talk about the time here. Two hours and 24 minutes isn't great, and remember that these cross-gen runs are weighted on a heavier scale. And if you want to know more about the tier card rankings and the formula, there is a video in the description. Reggie Alecki's tier card would have a total score of 81.53 out of 100, and that makes it pretty easily the worst cross-gen run to date because we don't really count Shedinja. What this one came down to was the rough Brock split and the fact that crits just aren't reliable and when your whole identity and your stats are allocated towards that, everything else just suffers a little bit. Now if you gave this thing a water or a grass move early, it might be an entirely different story. And I'd even go as far to say that if I had to make a Pokemon, I would rather have something with like 90 speed, maybe an electric version of a high crit move like Slash, and then I would put those extra 110 base stats into things like attack, special, or defense. But those are all just hypotheticals, and at the end of the day we can only judge a Pokemon for what it actually is. Is. Now if we look at a card on the vanilla tier list like Zapdos, it's crazy how similar these two Pokemon are. I think I could redo a run with Zapdos to only have like zero or one resets one day, but they're pretty much the same Pokemon with slightly different flavors. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons, I do appreciate the support a lot, and if you made it this far into the video, you're a real one, comment that down below. And I do have some like ambitious plans for the future videos, but the question for me is if I just have enough time to get everything done. I don't know if I will in December but we'll just have to see it's gonna be a great end to the year and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week and I'll just I'll catch you on the next one bye